seminar for this year, so we're excited to kick off the new season. Uh, the, uh, the purpose, as you know, of this series is uh, to celebrate the scholarship of scholars of color who are working in areas related to education. And, uh, uh, as you know, the School of Education is committed to diversity, but uh, uh, we don't have as much diversity on our faculty as we strive for. And, and, uh, so another way is to bring in some people. And there's a seat right up here. That's OK. <coughs> oh, come on in. <laughs> Don't be bashful. Come on in. Is this the place you're looking for? No. Nancy Lopez? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Don't come in. <laughs> Let me see where are they? I was talking about this great program. But uh, what, the reason uh, that I'm saying this is to get to the point which is um, we're always looking for new people that we might invite. And so I challenge each of you to spend a few minutes and think about scholars whose work you admire, uh, a scholar of color working in education, we define it broadly, uh, and feel free at any time to send either an email to Sean or myself to nominate these individuals. We don't ask for a lot, and we even take just really core nominations like the name, uh, but we prefer if you send a bio or something like that give us a little idea and maybe a sentence or two about why you're enthusiastic about it. But you know, if you don't have somebody in mind right now, it's December and you're in a meeting somewhere, and you read a paper from somebody or you hear a talk and you say, wow, now that's somebody I think my, my, my colleagues back at GSE would really profit from. Then at that point, send us a note, there's another seat up here. Uh, there's the one right here in the middle, or you say, oh, no, no. oh there's two. two. Come on, man. And uh, uh, so, uh, so we 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 think we're going to do this indefinitely, and uh, so you can help us make it successful. Uh, today uh, we have Nancy uh, Lopez, who uh, is a professor at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. And uh, very, very glad to have you here, Nancy. She, she actually, she's an East Coaster uh, by, uh, by uh, birth. birth and <laughs> growing up, she's a, she's a NYC product up here. Lived on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. In fact, uh, all the son lived there until just a couple months ago uh, for a long time, and they lived within blocks of, of each other down there on. The, Side. Uh, she went to Columbia University there in NYC as an undergraduate, and then she went to CUNY and got her doctorate in sociology. She is a sociologist. Uh, uh, and like so many people in education, some are in an ed school, and some are in uh, a discipline like economics or sociology or psychology. And we here are very interested in that broader. Array of, of, uh, of scholars. So uh, again, for that, it's good to have you here. She and a colleague just opened a new center, and I do want to mention that to you. I love the name of this center: Institute for the Study of Race and Social Justice. And this is with Laura Gomez there at uh, the University of Mexico. And I think that's taken some of her time right now, and certainly some of her enthusiasm energy, so uh, that's exciting. She has a book, a well-known book with a, another nice title, Hopeful Girls, Troubled Boys, Race and Gender Disparity in Urban Education. And she tells me she's revising this book right now, so uh, uh, we really uh, are pleased to have you here. And I know I look very much forward to your talk. Thank you for So it's really a, a privilege and an honor to be invited to be a part of this series and um, to have an opportunity to introduce you to my lifelong work in the area of race and ethnicity in education. Um, so the title of my talk today is to really think critically about how we can unpack race at multiple levels 
in schools, and in this case I'll be drawing on my experience doing research in New Mexico schools for the last, mm, I would say four to six years. <laughs> I've been in New Mexico for nine years, but have been doing research in several districts there for the last um, four to six years. Um, so the first thing I want to do is just give you a little bit of what I plan to do over the next hour. And first I'm going to start with an autobiographical note. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some analysis I did of a recent desegregation Supreme Court case that talks about how um, Supreme Court justices understand race. Um, then I want to share with you a little bit about the New Mexico context, which is very different from what we're used to here in the East Coast, so it's been a learning experience for me. And then, um, then I want to talk to you about the three districts that I'm doing it's related but independent studies. The first study was done in a very large district um, that I'm calling Santiago School District in New Mexico, and it was looking at the achievement gap. And the second study is one that is looking at the state of education in New Mexico, and I did it with a number of other COPIs, all of whom are Native American scholars at UNM along with graduate students. I was probably the non-native um, co-PI on that. And each of us took a district, one of, of seven districts in New Mexico, to understand what's happening with native youth there. And then the last study is a community-based action research study that I'm doing with a colleague in sociology, and that's um, Jane Hood. And what we're trying to understand is how discipline works in, the, um, in a diverse public school. And so all of these districts, I can't name, these are not the actual names, obviously IRB does not allow you to identify their names, but in many ways they're similar, in many ways they're different, and I'll talk a little bit more about them. Um, the interesting thing about the last study is that it was funded by the Sociological Initiatives Foundation, and one of their funding criteria is that you involve community throughout the research process. So that was a really important um, part of our research. Um, the last thing that I want to share with you is something that grows out of the work that I've been doing with Lara Gomez, who's a co-director with me for the Institute for the Study of Race and Social Justice. We founded that in 2009, and one of the products that came out of a number of initiatives, including a study group, a working group of multidisciplinary scholars on campus that are looking at race and inequality, and a speaker series is um, something that we have online now, and it's basically transdisciplinary research guidelines for doing um, research on race. So we have 10 guidelines that I'll, I'll hope to share with you, time permitting, before the end of my talk. So I want to start with this picture, and I'm so um, grateful to the young woman who helped me <laughs> download it because I couldn't do it last night. And this is where I grew up. Uh, how many of you have been to the Lower East Side? So the Lower East Side has traditionally been a mecca for immigrant families, and in, in this case my family came um, in the 1960s from the Dominican Republic. And my parents were typical um, immigrants in the sense that they did not have much formal education. They valued education, but certainly didn't know anything about how our edu educational system works. And I was born and raised in the tenements. And you'll see this picture was taken in the 1950s. This is Baruch Public Houses. I don't know how many of you know that it's on the corner of FDR Drive in Houston. And what was there before was tenements, you know, that were basically um, a way that uh, new immigrants were welcomed into <laughs> New York City. And it was ironic because it was seen as moving on up. Um, my parents worked in the garment industry in the 1970s in lower Manhattan. And um, the privilege of entering the projects in the 70s, I was about you know six or seven years old, was that it was fire retardant. So that meant that we didn't have to run out in the middle of the night because there was arson you know, happening in front of our, our tenement. And the reason I include this is because um, you need to understand racial inequality in terms of some of the policies that created these vertical ghettos. And a, a powerful um, book that I urge all of you to read is by Nancy Denton and um, Douglas Massey, American Apartheid, published in the mid-1990s and 94. And it really looks at the role of federal policies in creating segregation. I attended New York City Public Schools, graduated from Washington Irving High School in 87. And during my whole time there, I never sat in a classroom with another person that would be racialized as white. How could this happen in New York City? In, the, in these projects, I think there was a sprinkling during the 70s and 80s of white um, immigrants, but for the most part it was Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, African Americans, maybe you know, like one or two white families. But at the same time, if you know where the Williamsburg Bridge is, there are co-ops 
that were almost exclusively white. And it wasn't until the 1980s when there was a lawsuit that required that those co-ops stop discriminating against people of color, that people of color were allowed access into asset building <laughs> um, housing and what that means for intergenerational wealth and so on. So the reason I put this image here is because while we were confined to de facto segregated public housing with no asset building potential, there were other children of immigrants who had other options and obviously accounts for the disparities that we see not only in education, income, but also wealth. Um, but I thought that this was a very powerful image of how it is that race operates at the macro level. So one of the things that I've been working on is this problem. And this is put very eloquently by Omi Wanat. I encourage all of you, if you haven't read it, um, it's a book called Racial Formation in the United States from the 1960s through the 1990s. They, they posit that today, the absence of a clear common sense understanding of what racism means has become a significant obstacle to efforts aimed at challenging it. And that's very key. What is race? What is racism? Why is it important that we think very critically about what those terms mean? and what that means in terms of our praxis. So that, that's the problem that I want us to think about today. And I encourage you all to think very critically about how you understand race. My husband is also an artist. He's a Chicano who was born and raised in the Southwest in Colorado, but has family roots um, in New Mexico for multiple generations. And this is a piece that kind of exemplifies what's the common sense understanding of race, right? You remember the controversy over the Kennewick man. And this is where a skull was found in um, the northwest part of the, our country. And the question was brought up, is it Caucasian? Is it Native American? Who has a right to determine what's going to happen with the skull? So my husband made a piece <laughs> that it kind of uh, embodies this battle. A battle over the race and the origins of the first people in North America. The anthropologist says a skull Kennewick man looks like Star Trek actor Patrick Stewart, maybe from the blank tribe. Again, most people think of race as biology. All social scientists, biological science, scientists say there is no biological basis for race. Why does this idea persist and who benefits from it? So this kind of pokes fun at that idea. Um, so here, I just want to focus on these two points that Omi and Wanat make about the political nature of the definition of race. To interpret the meaning of race is to locate it in the social structure. So if you are making a definition of race, it has implications for the arrangements of our institutions. To locate the racial dimension of social structures is to interpret the meaning of race. What does that mean? If you are locating race within an institution, that's a definition of race. If you are choosing to ignore that, that's also a definition of race. That's an interpretation of race. So we have to really struggle with how it is that we're conceptualizing race. It's important that we have an expanded view of what race is. We're very used to thinking of race as this individual identity. In some cases, people think it's biological or cultural. But it's harder to really see how race fits in, into a multidimensional reality, social reality, how it has to do with representation, how it has to do with culture, how it has to do with your lived experience, your cumulative lived experience, how it has to do with power dynamics. So, it is the way sociologists look at race. It is a multidimensional concept at multiple levels of social reality, from the individual to institutions to macro level social forces. So it is imperative that we entertain unpacking race and racial dynamics as a social construction at all these levels. This other quote also comes from Omi Wanat. Every social institution is a racial institution but not every institution operates in the same way. Does that mean that every institution is racist? Obviously not. You can still have an institution that has race, that, that race is a part of, but it's not racist. The question is, how do we unpack how institutions are continuing to reproduce racial inequality or not, whether intentional or not? And some examples, we never think of the IRS or the Department of Ed or the Supreme Court as racial, but you can locate the racial dimension there in many ways. So I'm not going to go over these theoretical guideposts that guide my work, but I've mentioned Omi and Wanan. Charles Wagley has an interesting concept on social race. Gilborn, um, critical race theory, theorists like um, Laura Gomez and Ian Hane Lopez. And then, of course, Fran um, Frank Bonilla. I'm having a, a slip here. 
um, Eduardo Bonilla, Colorblind Racism and Intersectionality, particularly Patricia Hills Collins' work really guides most of my analysis. Um, <clears throat> the only sentence I want to focus on this quote is that today we have to identify racism as a function of consequences. It's not about individuals having racist ideas. It is a matter of the social arrangements and consequences that emerge from the organization of society. So again, um, this is not something that I'm going to read, but what I want to stress is that it is primarily a function of the consequences of existing social structures and organizations. That's, that's how we can understand contemporary racism today. Um, so now let me turn to how we can conceptualize race at the macro level. So sociologists like to always talk about those three levels. So here's the Supreme Court as probably the best place to understand how racial dynamics operate at the larger society. And the question that I pose today is how, does the, how do Supreme Court justices operationalize race in the schools? Well, you all are familiar with the recent um, Supreme Court ruling that outlawed desegregation programs in Louisville, Kentucky, and in Seattle, Washington. And um, you know the theoretical question I have regarding how these justices operationalize race is, what's the most productive way of describing race as a social construction without continuing the myth of race's biology? And so here I mentioned the case that I encourage all of you to read. It's probably two to 300 pages, but it's fascinating to see all the different opinions that were filed. The outcome I'm sure you're all familiar with. It was a, a split vote, 5-4, outlawing these programs because the idea was that um, we can't in any way have race-based programs in desegregating our schools. So um, the majority opinions were filed by Justice Roberts, Scalia, Kennedy, interestingly enough, and I'll turn to that in a second, filed a separate opinion, Thomas and Alito joined. The dissenting opinions were Breyer, Stevens, and Souter and Ginsburg. Um, the important thing was race was never defined. <laughs> never, even though the question was posed, if before a government makes racial decisions, we have to define what race is. It never was. It was never defined. The majority opinion defines race as an individual level, level characteristic. That's it. We're not going to look at context. We're not going to look at history. We're not going to look at power dynamics. We're only going to define it as this individual level identity. The dissenting opinion defining race as an individual level characteristic that is embedded within a socio-historical context and implicated in the social structure and power dynamics. So here's the majority opinion, Justice Roberts. The way to stop discriminating on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. So this is part of a larger racial project, interpretation and definition of racial dynamics and attempts to reallocate resources along racial lines. And it's a re-articulation of uh, Martin Luther King's dream where you know the color of your skin would not matter. It's a way of re-articulating anti-racist racial projects as racist. It's, it's the most paradoxical thing, but this is what's happening, that what previously have been programs that were completely anchored in racial justice are now being re-articulated as racist. So again, um, let me um, move on. Justice Kennedy, who joined the ma majority, had filed a separate opinion with a, re a reason. And the reason was that he disagreed with the argument. He agreed with the, in the outcome, which was we're not going to have any race-based desegregation programs. But he differed in terms of the opinion. He says, diversity, depending on its meaning and definition, is a compelling educational goal a school district may pursue. The enduring hope is that race should not matter. The reality is that too often it does. The pl plurality, plurality opinion is at least open to the interpretation that the Constitution requires that school districts ignore the problem of de facto desegregation in schooling. I cannot endorse that. He basically just agreed with the means, but he, his premise was de facto segregation is real. It, we need to intervene. I just disagree with the way in which it was being worked out in those two districts. So I found that very interesting. Um, Let's see. So Omi and Winant, how do they define racist racial projects? Although such programs necessarily and paradoxically employ racial criteria in assessing eligibility, they do not generally essentialize, I'm sorry, essentialize race because they seek to overcome specific socially and historically constructed inequality. And as I mentioned, my own li lived experience resonates with this because why is it that a young woman growing up in New York City public schools never sits in a classroom 
with someone from a so-called white race. How does that happen? How does this de facto segregation, desegregation happen? New York has never had a desegregation plan, ever. So it's very interesting. Um, Justice Stevens, this is the minority opinion and I, what I call a counter-hegemonic narrative on race. There is a cruel irony in the Chief Justice's reliance on our decision in Brown versus the Board of Ed. Indeed, the history books do not tell stories of white children struggling to attend black schools and, the, and, the, and this way and other ways. The Chief Justice rewrites the history of one of the court's most important decisions. So <clears throat> enough about <laughs> the macro level definitions of race. Let's move now to the meso and the micro levels. What's the difference between a multicultural and an anti-racist state? I just want you to think about that. What are the policies and practices that contribute to socio-historic and ongoing racial inequalities in schooling among entire categories of people? How do public school teachers in the Southwest operationalize race in the schools? This is important because this conceptualization, again, guides policy, it guides um, action. So it's ex incredibly important to understand this, um, how it is that people are defining race. Um, I was going to show you an image, and this is the link that I was looking for that the young woman helped me with, but it was just going to show you about uh, a little bit of the landscape in Albuquerque. Albuquerque's been around longer than the United States. You know, this was part of the uh, Spanish part of the U.S. that was um, under Spanish domain. Albuquerque actually lost an R <laughs> because it was too hard to pronounce when it was um, uh, next to the U.S. and what's interesting about New Mexico is that it's officially a bilingual state. So the United States doesn't have an official language. There is no, there is a national language, it's English, but in the state of New Mexico, Spanish is an official language. It has, it's, it's supposed to have equal footing with English. So what's interesting about it, we're a majority minority state. We're very small, we're about two million folks. Um, However, we have the largest Latino population in the country as a percentage of the number of residents. We also have the second largest Native American population. Um, we have a very small foreign born, percentage of foreign born. So, you know, relatively speaking, when we think about centers of immigration, it's pretty small. So that means the Hispanics, like I mentioned, my husband's family's been in New Mexico for as long as, you know, anybody can remember. Um, we have a very diverse Native American population with multiple languages that are spoken and different traditions and, and histories and arrangements. What's interesting when you look at the 2000, 2010 census is not available with this level of detail, a third of households speak another language at home. Most of that is Spanish, but that also includes native languages. And we are unique in that we have um, uh, state acts that specifically are geared towards uh, native communities in 2003, the Indian Education Act, and then in 2010, most recently, the Hispanic Education Act, all trying to deal with the longstanding and historic achievement gaps and inequalities in education. So, what did I find? And, and again, I'm going to be talking about those three projects. As a qualitative researcher, I'm very interested in understanding process, meanings, and interactions, and, and institutional arrangements that occur in the school. Teachers also subscribe to the natural law discourse and essentialist definitions of race as biology, even though there were some counter uh, hegemonic discourses about that. Um, and most of the time, the, the other reasons that were given for the presence of achievement gaps is that, of course, they belong to a culture of poverty, you know, these Latino and Native American kids. And there was very little, if any, although there were some teachers who questioned institutional arrangements that questioned tracking resource gaps and, and the differing pedagogies that are employed. Um, I mentioned earlier the difference between a multicultural and an anti-racist state. We often hear, um, you know, celebration of multiculturalism without any interrogation of power dynamics or inequality, institutionalized inequality. Um, in 2006, um, Richardson, when he was planning to run for president, declares a state of emergency again, harping on these controlling images of Mexican immigrants and illegal aliens, um, which was part, which is a national uh, racial project. And now, most recently, we have two governors, both the Democratic and Republican governors, who happen to be women. One of them is a woman of color, the Republican, Susana Martinez, and we have Diane Dennish. They are trying to undo a lot of the things that make New Mexico a little bit friendlier for um, undocumented immigrants, including 
the provision of um, driver's licenses. So this has been an ongoing issue in New Mexico. Um, in 2003, I don't know how many of you heard about two young men who were accosted by school police in violation of the school policy that says you may not inquire about anyone's, any student's legal residence and, and assume that they were dealing drugs. Why? They were brown-skinned Mexicans. So I think to myself, what would the difference have been had these been German or anyone who phenotypically wouldn't look like an illegal alien, whatever that means. So these young men, until Maldef stepped in, were going to be deported. And they were, like many of the children of undocumented, maybe they weren't born here, but had had all their lived experience in, in US schools. But the only reason they were singled out, and again, in violation of school policy, asked to produce identification is because they were brown. Um, in 2009, our current mayor in Albuquerque campaigned against the so-called previous mayor's sanctuary policies against immigration, I'm sorry, against um, immigrants who were arrested. So now, if you are arrested, ICE, the Immigration Control and Enforcement will come and check and see whether or not. And the idea is that there are some provisions that are in place for survivors of domestic violence, but we had a very tragic murder, double murder, and um, stalking incident that involved a UNM professor and um, a graduate student who were romantically involved where her previous um, boyfriend came and murdered them both. And interestingly enough, after this happened, um, this is Hector Torres and, um, gosh, I'm blanking on her name. Um, I can't remember her name right now. She had called and placed an order of protection against this man who was not an immigrant in any way. Um, and he called and, said, and reported domestic violence against her. So where do you draw the line? <laughs> you know, if she had been undocumented, they potentially could have arrested her because he accused her of the same thing. So here's a policy that we know a lot of our criminology um, studies say that if we want to promote community trusting relations, this policy does not work particularly in immigrant communities, but nevertheless, it's politically expedient. What happened here? Okay, so the district that I was looking at Santiago, right? Nobody knows what it is. Um, has uh, had a database where we looked at um, ninth graders. And this is with my colleague Jane Hood. And so we were trying to figure out who out of this population of ninth graders in 2006 were, were getting disciplinary referrals. Well, we already know that more boys in general, free lunch students, right? Uh, English language learners were getting referrals, special education. Um, gifted, not as much, and over 14 uh, in ninth grade, people who are overage, obviously, they have a higher rate of referral. Um, the high school within this district that I was looking at is two-thirds Hispanic, a quarter Anglo, only 50% of the students graduate, a third on free lunch. The teacher demographics are almost reversed. Teachers aides, again, and this mirrors the entire, I mean, I can be giving this for any district. Most of the teacher's aides are women of color, <laughs> and of course they're paid minimum wage and do an enormous amount of work. And out of school suspension, disproportionately, kids of color. So um, I was doing participant observation. Again, ninth grade and 10th grade, as you know, is the area where most of the suspensions happen. And then we followed up with interviews. Um, we see the same achievement gaps you know, that we see across the country. If you even look at graduation rates, it pretty much mirrors what we see across the country, the same. Thing, less than half graduate and we can go down the line African Americans and Hispanics are almost the same Native Americans have the lowest um, and so on of course Anglo students are and the term Anglo is the term that's used in the Southwest for white students um, overrepresented in all of the elite parts of the curriculum so I asked teachers how they define race and it's kind of ironic because this particular teacher was a gifted teacher um, teaching ninth grade students Anglo woman in her 20s, and she resorted to the biological definition, right? I took an anthro course at the public university, she's a graduate of our program, and we discussed mongoloid, caucasoid, and negroid, those three bases, and then from there you have different ethnicity, like I'm caucasoid, but German, so they, I would say my race is Anglo and my ethnicity is German. Why does it matter how you interpret race? Because in her view, if it's this individual level biological characteristic, you're not going to look at the institution, you're not going to look at cultural representation, you're not going to look at power dynamics. You're not going to examine any of those um, dimensions. So it's, 
it's really alarming because um, in our program, in sociology, we do not require that anyone take a course on race. Of course, it's mentioned in intro, but many of our graduate students who are not prepared and have not been, you know, unless they're, they're studying race, will actually repeat this mantra. <laughs> so it's pretty alarming because this should not be happening. And though I've been trying to have our curriculum change, it hasn't happened. We do have a racial equity and inclusion committee and task force in our department, so that's one of the things that we want to deal with. Um, <clears throat> here's an assistant principal, Anglo male in his 50s, Mr. Peets, who says, you know, we really, really stress the diversity issue at our school, you know, and it's never going to work 100% anywhere. You run up against some things. I just don't see a lot of the Hispanic kids hanging out with the white kids, which to me is kind of sad. But at the same level, I think it's somewhat natural, too. You really can't go speaker, um, really caring about these young people. However, if you still hang on to this idea of race as biology, you're not going to see the institutional dynamics like tracking, like lack of representation of teachers of color, and you're going to think it's simply nature that accounts for why we see the segregation in our classes. And um, it's, it's quite unfortunate. The disciplinary discretion issue emerged from that achievement gap study that I started in 2006. And here's a man of color. He was actually African American, police, retired police officer who now worked in the public schools. And I asked him, well, how do you determine which fights get referred to APD, the you know Albuquerque Police Department, or <laughs> versus which ones are handled in house? And he says, you know, it's the officer's discretion. You're supposed to witness the fight before you can arrest them, technically by law. But what I've done with my supervisor is that if I get that teacher to write me a detailed report or statement or what you've heard, me and my partner, we arrest them and we take them down to the D home. So it, the other interesting dynamic was that at this high school, which had over uh, 2,000 students, the only bilingual assistant um, principal was located in the security office. And um, there's another middle school, and I mentioned this as an aside that was not part of this study, that makes any in-school suspension uh, student, and this is a school that's 90% Hispanic, almost all immigrant, in the west side of Albuquerque, which is known as like the immigrant part of Albuquerque, wear an orange vest and line up against the wall <laughs> because they are the bad apples and we need to separate them. So these are the common sense ideas. And this man, again, like Mr. Peets, completely committed to these young people and trying to be a role model and talking about how after his retirement he wanted to come and work with youth because he grew up in similar circumstances and described to me that if it's a gifted kid they're not going to be taken to the D home because he knows that they have parents at home that can help them and set them on the right path however if it's a kid who grew up like he did he knows that taking them to the D home is going to you know really change them and, and make them wake up so again, these are the common sense ideologies. This is how these disparities get practiced. I use this image because I found it so compelling. I mentioned it in my book, Hopeful Girls, Troubled Boys, Race and Gender Disparity in Urban N. And it was a photo essay that was published in the New York Times Magazine in 1998. But, and it was on 13 year olds across the country. Not once was race mention. However, the hegemonic controlling images that justify the oppression of communities of color were rampant. And interestingly enough, African Americans were noticeably, noticeably absent or people of African ancestry. It was mostly featured on producing the idea of white masculinity as benevolent, independent, and Latino or boy, you know, boy of color masculinity as inherently violent and dangerous. And you know, they entertain each other by beating each other up. And, the, and the, what was frightening about it is that after the um, photo essay came out, you saw the op-ed saying, thank you for showing us the realities. So these are the images that go into a lot of the zero tolerance, a lot of the um, ideas that now almost in New York City public schools, for instance, the, the police department controls all of the uh, security and in, in uh, Albuquerque public schools, all the security are armed. These are the images that feed into these um, policies. So in my observations, one of the classrooms that I observed was taught by um, a Latina, veteran Latina teacher who, talk, uh, who was teaching special ed and it felt like a prison. You walked in, the teacher's desk was in the back, um, 
the first thing the young man who's a uh, young Chicano <laughs> boy wearing earrings says to me is, are you here to see how stupid we are? So this real sense that of cumulative um, lived experience that is, is stigmatizing. Um, continually refer to them as gangsters. Um, she says, I don't assign homework because they don't have parents that could help them. The entire semester, nothing went on in terms of any meaningful learning activity. And so how did the boys respond? You know, they, made they tried to do what they could, um, performing hip hop, they were very active in other things, sports, playing music, um, and many of them just sat throughout the whole class just with their heads buried in their desks and their little worksheets. But there was really nothing going on. If you go out and, and you just go across the hall, you wouldn't believe that there's a country club <laughs> replete with sofas and all kinds of extracurricular activities. Again, mostly white, no students of color there, um, mostly boys. And that was the interesting contrast. Both of those classrooms were mostly boys. So you could count on one hand how many young women were there. And even our quantitative data showed that the gifted um, programs were mostly white boys. It was very interesting because it kind of um, challenges a, a lot of what I've been looking at. And they were acting out just as often, but what did Miss Smith say? Well, they're smarter than I am. They're precocious. Uh, they were never referred to the, to the discipline office. They had access to couches. They had an enormous amount of independence, hand, um, hand um, on experiences, trips, and so on and so on. And incidentally, many times heard the students using racist language to refer to Mexican immigrant youth never challenged. Most people don't know that I speak Spanish as my first language, so um, it's very interesting. In New Mexico, anyway, that wouldn't happen in New York, I think. So uh, it was a very interesting experience, very, very interesting experience. So there were people who critiqued it, and this is another a white teacher in her 20s also, like Miss Smith, but she goes, well, when I asked her if race has ever come up, she goes, I'm not sure if I should bring this up, but there was a teacher who was let go because of a racial inc incident using the N-word in casual conversation with a student this semester. And the way the school responded was, let's gather all the African-American students and counsel them. That was the response. Rather than looking at what is it that we're doing in our curriculum, in the way that our resources are distributed to address these issues. Um, there were countless Mexican immigrant youth who would tell me that they were called Mojado, wet back, and all kinds of language. And it was seen as a joke, including Miss Anaya, another Chicana teacher who had been teaching for 30 some odd years, using that term as if though it's funny. So none of that was ever addressed, even though there was a well intentioned principal there who gave a copy of, you know, why are all the black kids sitting together in the classroom, the Tatum book. But there was no follow through with that. Um, and it certainly wasn't incorporated into the curriculum of the youth. The, so the school newspaper uh, touts, again, we're diverse, but never really deals with the deep, deep racial inequalities that are happening. Parent organizers, there was a grant from the Kellogg Foundation that funded um, community living rooms for all of the, or a number of schools with a high percentage of minority youth. They were very well aware of what they were up against. <laughs> I mean. This one particular organizer, parent organizer, says, there are some administrators that don't even want the community living room. They see us as a watchdog. When people see you as a watchdog, then they're doing something wrong. We've known teachers that have been inappropriate with our girls. What do I envision? Community faculty. So this real understanding that there was hostility to the idea that there would be a safe space in the school for, in this case, it was targeting Hispanic youth, but youth of color in general. And incidentally, it was at another middle school where I was doing some field work where it came up during a focus group with these middle school young Latina girls that they felt very safe coming to this space that was run by parents who spoke their language and understood their culture. And I said, well, what is happening in your classroom that makes you feel uncomfortable? And it was revealed that was a, there was a teacher with a screensaver with a woman's trasero there. If anyone knows Spanish, that means a woman's ass. And this was seen as something that <laughs> You know, when we approached the principal and the, and the community volunteers were just in shock. I didn't know this was happening. They never told us this. The principal said, well, you know, this teacher is new. We've talked to him, and that was the end of that. But just this constant hostility, and um, particularly for the young women, the sexual harassment that was going on. All right, so here's um, Ms. Rivera, dual language um, teacher, who's Latina and had 
and taught math, of course, that where you're not really supposed to talk about social justice, <laughs> but she made it a point to do that as part of the learning that happened in her class. If it's a problem for Latinos, it's my problem. If there's a cause that's about social justice, then it's your cause. It's happening all over the U.S., boycotts, no buying. It's a day without immigrants. So teachers had to organize for students to participate in this walkout because they were threatened with suspension. Particularly young boys were told, and it was interesting because when you saw the 150 students who walked out in April of 2006 to be part of this National Day of Action, it was mostly girls because it's particularly the young boys were told, if you go, you will be suspended. But the teachers were able to negotiate, and this is one of the teachers who, I, it was sad to know, uh, several years later I ran into her and said she had to leave because it was just so hostile. So that happens quite a bit, not only with teachers of color, but even white anti-racist teachers. Um, <clears throat> so here she goes um, and points out some interesting <laughs> points. How did it go at the rally? And she explained that she couldn't go because she was basically told she was gonna be fired if she went. Um, yesterday was a very important day for Hispanics. We're over 40 million. We're a large part of the U.S. economy. We want a migration accord for those of us who are living on the border. We had a great impact today, even though they don't want to admit it. That is how Martin Luther King wants civil rights for us, boycotts. We're no longer afraid. We're not invaders. We want to be a part of this country. Our soldiers have died in war. And if you walked into that classroom, you would see the same images of social justice and drawing on figures from Latin American history and, and U.S. history that was completely inspiring and the kind of authentic reciprocal relationships that she established with students who brought her food, she brought them uh, clothing. I mean, this was an incredibly um, inspiring uh, woman. And there were several of them, but this is one of the ones that um, in many ways um, embodied this commitment to the, the youth. Um, the only point I want to take away here is that most of the infractions that were cited or written up were for rule breaking. It wasn't really serious crimes. And in effect, what, it, what this, you know, the in-school suspension policies do is take kids away from class. So it, it's not a very effective way of dealing with infractions. Um, let's see. Okay, so this was looking specifically at the smaller number that are really subjected to in, uh, out of school suspension. So students who obviously commit uh, more serious crimes like real bodily uh, um, damage or drugs are gonna be subjected to that. We have such a small number of Asians that we were puzzled by this, but it, you know, it's, it's, it's a tiny number. African Americans over nationally, but Albuquerque is no exception, are disproportionately targeted for out-of-school suspension, um, reclassified freshmen over age freshmen, and of course, um, special ed kids that are in restrictive environments, and of course, not gifted. Okay, so before we were able to get this grant from the Sociological Initiatives Foundation that involved the community as co-researchers, the superintendent changed. <laughs> at the school district that we were at. And when the new superintendent came in and said, we have no interest, we have no problem with discipline, we have no interest in your study. So we found another district that actually welcomed us, a smaller district, somewhat suburban. Um, and in this particular high school, it was large, but the, the actual district is much smaller than the previous one that had 95,000 students. And similar demographics, right? Half white, th there's definitely more Hispanics in the other um, district. But we wanted to see what students were saying, you know, was happening with discipline and how we could explain these national disparities, but, you know, in the in New Mexico context. So we did participant observation. Um, we also formed a discipline study group. And initially, IRB at UNM refused to allow us to have um, students because the thought was, well, what if a student finds out about some personal situation with another student? And we, we explained that this is a learning process. They'll learn about IRB. and and confidentiality and it didn't didn't fly but nevertheless they allowed us to bring in parents and teachers and we're still you know we've had three meetings we've collected all the data and now we're ready to make policy recommendations to the school board jointly so it's been a really wonderful um, learning experience in spite of some of the resistance so most of the work was again in the classroom and doing participant observation and focus groups um, this school has the most draconian dress code <laughs> that you could ever imagine. And 
I didn't include some of the quotes from the teachers, but the <coughs> argument was, we need to teach them order. If they are going to learn how to become productive citizens, they have to follow our rules. And I mean, it was ins insanity. And here's just a quote from a Latina 10th grader talking about the dress code. I was wearing a university shirt that we got for participating in the race at the university. My, mo my teacher wrote me up. My dad called. Lunch detention was taken off. But here's one of the dress codes is you can't have any logo on your shirt. So here's a young woman who's wearing a university shirt but is being disciplined and potentially you know, um, put on, on so many problems. And the critique overall was they take away time from my learning. I think that's dumb. Even the parents agreed. The study group agreed. This is ridiculous. Why is the policy still in place? Well, the school board says that we have to have a policy. And we're going to have a conversation with them. <laughs> and here's another example of Ana, another Latina 10th grader. She says, my shirt had to have a button on it. That's the other rule. <laughs> I don't think this makes sense. I got three days of lunch detention. My parents didn't call. I went for two days, but the last day I didn't go for the whole day. I was stuck in the room with the security guards. I didn't get some of the work that I'm supposed to learn. They take away time from my learning. So these are the Latina girls in the focus group. Now we have state, um, I'm sorry. Oh, I didn't write her name down. I think her name I put Melissa. This is an Anglo girl, she goes. I was not in dress code, but I got out of it. And this was in the same focus group. It was a plaid shirt that didn't have a button or a collar. My teacher asked me about it, and I told her that my button fell off. The next day, I sewed a button on it. And even the security guards would tell me, oh, that's the gifted table, or those are the smart kids, or the mostly white kids. We don't mess with them, even though they, they, they're, not, they're not troublemakers. These are security of color saying the same thing. So it's very interesting how discretion works at this level. This case, uh, Stacy, African-American young girl, who um, is very tall and buxom, and was subjected to an enormous amount of sexual harassment that all the security guards knew about in the lunchroom. They say, oh, yeah, <coughs> this guy's really harassing her, harassing her. What did she do? She finally bopped him and hit him because no one intervened on her behalf. Guess who got punished? And it is seen as, you know, perfectly fine. So he, here she was stuck in, in school suspension for days, missing out of uh, classwork because no one intervened on her behalf. And all the security knew about it, even, even the AP knew about it, but she was disciplined. So we see these national figures on African Americans being disproportionately subjected to discipline, and it is happening every day as common sense because she hit him. It's, it's really, and we've met with the principal, and as I said, the discipline study group is going to be presenting before the school board. And there have been a few changes, like lunch, det lunch detention has been taken off. Now they have after school detention. Um, there is some attempt, the other thing that I forgot to mention was that they also require that there's no public open bathroom during changing period. This school is very weird. So what happens, the only way that you can go to the bathroom, there's one in a school of almost 3,000 students, and there's a whole you know, um, complex <coughs> of buildings. There's one bathroom that's open. Besides that, you have to ask for a pass. When a teacher decides they don't want to give you a pass, then you will have to suffer. And I'm only thinking about women in particular, but also young men who need to use the bathroom. And there was an incident I was observing um, one teacher who insisted that a young African-American girl, and keep in mind that New Mexico's African-American population is in the single digits. It's like 3%. And in this school, there was no, ex no exception. Why again? Young African-American girl asking, can I please miss, um, miss or whatever I, I named that teacher at the time, can I use the bathroom? No. She was sent to the back of the corner to sit there and fidget for the rest of the semester. Obviously, couldn't, I mean, for the rest of the class, couldn't concentrate in, in that class. What is it about blackness that is so frightening to a lot of these teachers? It, and it's, again, not unique to, to New Mexico. This is national. Um, and it's interesting that it's directed towards both boys and girls. OK, so th yeah, that's the story I, was, I thought I hadn't prepared this slide. Um, this is the most interesting thing, this particular teacher. And one of the big findings that came out of this discipline study is that pedagogy and discipline are just so interconnected. She broke the dress code on many occasions and was wearing extremely revealing clothing and just 
you know, very, um, very hostile towards youth, had this pedagogy that was in incredibly authoritarian and one directional and um, just very unproductive way of relating with the children uh, based on banking education. Um, I don't know how we're doing on time, if we have another 15, 20 minutes or? Oh, that's not good. Okay, <laughs> let me talk about the Indian edit. This is the last study. And hopefully maybe in five to 10 minutes I can wrap up. So this grant came out of the New Mexico Public Education Department and the purpose was to assess what impact, if any, the Indian Education Act that was uh, passed in 2003 had on the education of Native youth. As I said, their indicators are worse than any other group in the state. Um, interestingly enough, the PED never gave us the quantitative data. It was a mixed method study, but they refused after multiple requests. Very interesting. And they funded the study. <laughs> so I was part of the qualitative te team, and I was in charge of one of the districts, which is um, almost half Native American. And this is very unique. This is a border town, and this is a town where there have been a lot of conflicts between Native communities and majority communities and Hispanic communities as well. Um, Again, the same demographics, right? Very few native teachers, and if they are found, they're mostly teachers' aides. Um, <clears throat> this was a student who was actually enrolled at the public university, and we did preliminary, preliminary focus groups with them. And he kind of described this border dynamic that happens with native communities in New Mexico and the lines that are drawn between New Mexican Hispanics and natives. And they say, uh, they're, this is a, a Diné student. They're New Mexicans. They've been here for like, you know, 14th generations. They really hate the Navajos. There would be fights, and the principal, he would suspend and ex expel the Indian kids. And then one day later, the New Mexican kids would be back after a fight. What we would do is stand against the hall, against the wall, and we'd start talking in our language back and forth between us. So this is their way of resisting the racially stigmatized masculinities <coughs> that um, they were being uh, subjected to. Uh, here's a, a, an EA, an educational assistant in this district, who talks about some of the problems that have happened because the higher administration excludes them. They're, they're not in a position of power. If there are any native faculty, they're usually EAs. So, she was critiquing the fact that a discipline committee was put together and none of the native faculty, maybe with one exception, was included when most of the people that work, and she teaches Keras in, in, in this case. Well, we've experienced a lot of things. They pay trainers to be here and train us how to work with our students, and it doesn't work for our Indian students because it doesn't come from our Indian point of view. It's coming from the non-Indian kids, how they're being utilized, how they're being trained. It worked for them, but not for our students. That's one reason why our students are constantly out of hand. So if we all come together, we have to come together as a community with the staff here to really come up with our own discipline policy. Um, but that's, that's a, a serious problem. When I asked students about how they envision themselves becoming educated Native people, they said, you know, I'd still want to come back here to the school, you know, because they have this youth center here. I probably wouldn't even get the best pay, but I'd still want to come back here and support my community. I want to be a community organizer. So over and over again, the Native youth that we talked to talked about being a professional, educated youth to come back to the community. And how does that happen? How do you create that bridge? Um, <clears throat> this is another <laughs> example of the need for training and racial equity. Middle school in that district, mostly Native students. And this particular middle school was probably like 80% Native. And this one teacher, Anglo teacher, equated the experience of her and her daughter going abroad to Latin America to the process that a native youth goes through <laughs> in, in um, US schools. And she goes, I know the other side because I've had to send my child to learn the reigning culture's language. And when I lived in Latin America, when I lived with Latin America with my daughter, there's no way my child could have functioned in a culture without doing that. If she hadn't been willing to learn Spanish, hadn't been willing to learn about the culture she was in. This is serious. This is a school that has mostly Native youth. And the next teacher, and this is a teacher focus group, these are all English teachers in middle school, says we need to bring back the boarding schools for Native American youth. And, he, and I appreciated his honesty, because most people won't say that these days. Mm -hmm. 
but this particular stu uh, teacher felt he had to share that he really felt there was no other way. And he says boarding schools from kindergarten to first grade, they go and live just like prep schools. They go and live on the school site for the whole year, go home during vacations, go home during the summer. And there they have a family that they'll live with here and stay here on campus. I guess it's like the Santa Fe Indian School, but not geared towards, you know, the whole idea of Indian education, but here. So, and this is a man who described himself as wanting to go into teaching to help these poor youth. Mm -hmm. But again, this is the understanding. In fact, during the focus group, some of the teachers shared that um, they didn't believe that Pueblo Indians knew how to pay taxes. I mean, it just implied all these negative, very negative stereotypes. And the other dynamic is these were all faculty and graduate students of color interviewing mostly white teachers. So it, I think that that also explains a little bit of the context. Okay. Um, yeah, during our focus groups, we, I mean, we've witnessed and almost nearly missed getting hit by, you know, um, leaking ceilings. It kind of reminded me of my experience in New York. <laughs> doing my field work, uh, students saying how much they miss the fact that they, in a mostly Native district, don't teach anything about Native history or culture, mm -hmm. that they mostly do this banking education through worksheets. Um, <clears throat> again, a teacher critiquing how it is that um, most of his peers encourage him to suspend as many Native kids as possible, and he says, this is not making any sense, this is wrong. Um, Let's see. So here are some of the things that the students would say that they love hands-on work. Um, a teacher saying that she tries to do engaged pedagogy as one of the best practices for, for trying to get um, students to do well. Um, and some other critiques. Now, the last thing I did want to share with you is the guidelines. So I'm hoping I can have five minutes to do that, if, if that's OK. I won't explain them, but I just want to mention them. <laughs> and I know I've gone over my time. So um, I'm not going to go into the institute because you will um, see that without a doubt if you look on the website. So the question I want you to think about is this. How should the fact that race is socially constructed in a multidimensional phenomenon be measured and understood by researchers studying education and inequality? Um, and then I'll just share the first one. So who benefits from the idea of maintaining that myth that race is biology? That's something we need to interrogate. We have to make sure that we're not using race and ethnicity interchangeably. That's something that we should think about. Um, we, shouldn't, we should be very attentive to how race is defined. This one is really trying to encourage mixed methods. These are all available online. At the very end, you'll see the last slide that has um, the website for the Institute for the Study of Race and Social Justice. We should encourage um, multi-generational and multi-longitudinal uh, data. Um, let's see. Um, we should also pay attention to the connections between race and class stratification, not the assumption that these two things are interchangeable. Um, these are very important things for us to keep in mind as, as researchers. Um, context matters. Uh, be very careful. You know, your instruments are not going to work in New Mexico or, you know, if, if you're bringing them from New York. It's a very different lay of the land. So think, think about how you're going to incorporate that into your design. Um, it's analytically important to disentangle race and racism. And, and I'll just leave it at that by saying that the hegemonic understanding, the colorblind racist understanding of race is that if you mention race, then you're racist. I think we need to disentangle those two things. Um, number, oh, I forgot number eight. Sorry about that. Uh, this is part of the reason why I shared my autobiography. I think it's incredibly important for you to think about how your cumulative lived experience informs not only your theorizing, but also your, your worldview. Um, oh, here's number eight. Um, <laughs> Always consider the ethical implications of your work. And, um, and then start with the end in mind for applied interventions in particular. What would a society anchored in diversity, excellence, and justice um, for communities look like? How would we get there? Um, and I love this quote from uh, Patricia Hill Collins. How do my thoughts and actions dismantle, dismantle someone else's oppression, foster community development, and form part of a larger social justice project for human liberation at the individual, cultural, and institutional levels. 
and I thank you for your kind attention. It's been a real joy. I was part of the gifted program, and I was part of the sort of uh, AP program, the advanced placement. And I mean, I was thinking about my experience just now, where you're talking about what other sort of Chicanos were in class or Hispanics. And maybe there are one or two, and we had a few. Uh, Mr. Castillo was one of the AP teachers. Um, but I wonder, so in that case, you know, I got sent to in school suspension every now and then for breaking these draconian dress codes. So it's this weird sort of socially And did your peers get sent to for the um, same not the lighter skin, the Chicanos, <laughs> um, but now, so when I think about race and this sort of socially, as this idea of a social construct, um, in what sense was I, did I have, did I did not have that sort of Chicano experience or the, the Hispanic experience in the classroom because I was part of this uh, AP gifted elite program. I mean, I come from a you know working class background also. Um, because now when I think about it here, and I sort of assert my Chicano ness or whatever, my friends said, "No, you just have a good tan. Like, your brother's a PhD too." And your hair. Um, so, and I, and I, I mean, I struggle with this sort of idea personally. You know, I have I a graduate and, student who just finished her dissertation looking at this very issue. It was mostly mixed race um, Hispanics in a predominantly white school within the large district that shall remain nameless. And what she found is that there was a different experience for mixed race, especially if it's mixed race white and Hispanic. And um, her name is Shalane Latruga. I encourage you to read her dissertation because I think it's one of the few. Most of the studies that we have on Latino ed are in schools like the ones that I was in, where it's mostly Latino. We already know what <laughs> the dynamics are very clear. But we know less about what's happening in, and I'm assuming you went to a school that was in hyper-segregated. I'm assuming it was. Um, it was quite a. a yeah, Roswell, so New Mexico, so there was quite a few. Uh, so the majority white? Um, probably majority Hispanic. Hispanic, yeah. okay. I've never been to Roswell, even though I understand but that. So even, don't this uh, is from there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My answer to you is context, context, context. And also looking at how it is that um, because, and interestingly enough the high school that I went to Washington Irving does anybody know that school it's in Irving place it's kind of like in sort of Midtown it's like 16th Street but it's not really Midtown anyway it was the last public large urban school in New York City that um, was exclusively for women until the mid 80s until the year I graduated and then it became co-ed we had a 25 percent graduation rate even within there that was tracking I was fortunate enough to be tracked in the so-called honors program, and guess what that is now? The bare minimum to get a, a high school <laughs> diploma, which is a regents diploma. I was of that 1%, and we formed a very different group within that setting that had access to things like, we had um, counselors come from Columbia University, and actually that's how I ended up at Columbia. Someone came and said, hey, there's a program, Double Discovery, first generation you know, college students, and got employment for me for the summer. So even within that hyper-segregated background, there was tracking, and we had privileges. And we were all students of color. There were no white students at that school. But we were identified as the ones that had hope and somehow had access to a different kind of relationship with the school. Yes. Thank you so much. I mean, that was such an edifying and tremendous presentation. Thank you so much. And just kind of building off this, uh, well, I want to thank you for bringing up Ms. Rivera as an example of a teacher who's you know, um, teaching against these kind of hegemonic ideologies. But w just getting back to the whole gifted thing, I mean, it, I just throwing this out there made me think, when I was a school teacher in California, in an elementary school that had about 1,200 kids, predominantly uh, Mexican, African-American, and Filipino, less than 1% were designated gifted and talented. And then when I was a professor in the Midwest at the local school, 80% of the kids were designated Wow. And they even developed a new category called profoundly gifted talent. <laughs> <laughs> mostly, and I say this because it was a college town, right? Mostly, and I wonder, and 
And I mean, I just want to add that I would hold the kids in California everything, their test scores, their writing, up against, you know, the students in the Midwest. Sure. Of course, I just, that goes without saying. But, you know, how we as like, an, an, that was a kind of college town, it was like a school, you know, a lot of professors, kids, and I would hear the same thing, that the students are not doing well because they're not engaged, you know. But we're so invested in notions of intelligence, you know, in the academy, so like, that, and that's so smart, or, you know, and it, it's so racialized as well. I don't know, I just wanted to mention that. Well, Annegret Steiger, I don't know if you know her work, has done really interesting work in California schools looking at magnet programs and how they reproduce um, white supremacist logic, mm -hmm. where the argument is, you know, even though we have that one or two Hispanic or black kid in the gifted program, they're not really that gifted. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they might be, the Asians might be here, but it's because they work hard. They're not really gifted. And so how whiteness becomes the only way, the only way that gifted is understood. And it's very interesting because I do have a colleague <laughs> who has her children in a gifted program. She's a white woman. And she told me that, you know, her son had trouble on that exam and they let him redo it. And once you're designated as gifted, you are forever gifted. You're not retested in any way. And when I went to inquire about the same program, she's like, are you sure you really want your child to be in this program? It's kind of hard. So it's very interesting. It's, I mean, at the time, you know, she didn't know whether or not I was a professor or whatever, but I, I just find it interesting because I've encountered the same thing with other African-American um, professionals and other women of color who've tried to inquire about giftedness being told the same thing. Your children are not really that gifted. So it's very interesting. You should say, no, they are profoundly gifted. <laughs> I learned a new term. Or like Miss Smith, would say, because we had a student who was actually special ed, white male student, and gifted, twice exceptional. Yes, yes um, on this principle of tracking, I, um, I kind of have a very basic question, because I went to school in China as well as in the United States. And in China, we don't have such thing as tracking. And I don't know if it exists in a lot of other cultures, I mean, I mean other nations, too. Why is it so important in this country we have tracking? Is it because the race and everything? I just want to get a better understanding. We have an investment. I get started. We have an investment in, in this idea that we're in a meritocracy and that we, this is a contest. What station you earn in life, it's because of your innate talent, right? Your genetic ability and your effort. So it's a combination of both. With hard work and the right genes, you will, you know, the, you will shape, that, that will shape what station you get in life. There's a commitment to that merit meritocratic language in this country, and we have a contest system. It's like, who is, who's gonna score highest on the SAT score? Who's gonna score highest on these state assessment tests? This is where we need to concentrate our, our resources, and we've all seen the bell curve, I'm sure you have, where the argument is an essentialist argument again, that most of our intelligence is innate. We, can't, we can try to change and finagle with that, but for the most part, you're born with the intelligence. So when did tracking get started in this country? It starts very early, very early. Probably standardized testing happens. Yeah. Oh, also, like historically, as like, what, what year? I, I don't know that we could locate a year, but that's a very important part, the genealogy of this, of this process. I don't know if it, someone in the room knows the answer to that. But it's an important question because, I mean, uh, the one thing I, that occurs to me is, was there any kind of stratification or inequality in China? And whether it's r racial or ethnic or language based, yeah, I don't know. So, no. I mean, we're in schools, so we, guess, we all thought we were telling the gifted in a way, you can consider it that, you know? We're at least more at the ego level if we're not all telling the gifted, we're little. But would you be able to discern any differences in resources among the schools, or even within a school among certain groups of students? Yeah, I've been out of the country for way too long to like, understand like now how it works, but when I went to school, I didn't think there was such a difference in resources. I was told by a Chinese student um, who's here now for her master's that she was told what um, university major she could have based on test scores. So she was able to choose for herself, you know, she was more interested in, in psychology or things like that, but she was put in, or math, but she was put into international relations instead. <laughs> so yeah. it's kind of in, um, it may not be as visible, her, Yeah, there's some, there seems to be some kind of system, maybe, maybe not resource-based, right? 
idea? Yeah. Yes. I was just going to comment on that question just raised. I do research on stratification in China. I'm glad you're here. I don't have resource differences as much, but I, I have an ongoing project in a rural part of the northwest, a, a rural part of a province in the northwestern part of China. Definitely there are, um, I mean, if you look just sort of an aggregate statistics, there are very dramatic regional differences in our rural differences in funding for schools and um, sort of more anecdotally in the school environments that you find wealthier urban and very poor rural areas. Um, I think a lot of the tracking has to do with the types of schools that people end up going to. Um, one of them is in schools. Yeah, I think going to urban schooling. Yeah, we have strength medication. Okay, as a student in China. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So in some schools, they have the advanced classes and you know, the normal classes. So if you get into, you have to take the exam and you get into the advanced classes and you have a better opportunity to get into better schools because the teacher resources are different. Absolutely. Like at my school, there was not a single AP class. Mm -hmm. Honors was what's now the minimum requirement for graduation. Right. However, it was interesting because, because of the model minority stereotype, there were Asian um, students who were at that school that arrangements were made for them to go to Stuyvesant. Does anyone know of Stuyvesant? Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, we all scored pretty high on our regents, and, but none of us were allowed. Why? Because the myth is, right, all Asians are good at math. Stuyvesant has AP classes, so they were allowed to go, but none of the Caribbean or Latina or black girls were. It was interesting, and it was an all-girls school. But again, it's because of these controlling images. Asians are just naturally good at math, and therefore we'll make the arrangements for them to attend, but not you guys. I thought it was really, really interesting. Even though, again, it was all based on our scores, the myth that Asians are good. They were not sent to English AP. <laughs> they were sent to math AP. And, and the schools actually were two blocks away from each other, basically, but couldn't be demographically more different, very different. And that didn't mean that some of us didn't try to apply to those schools. We did, but we didn't get in. So de facto segregation, New York style. <laughs> and a lot, and I, I, I think it's probably changed now, but a lot of the way that most of the students got in there is that they had been in private, very resource-rich schools beforehand. Not all, but a good number of them. In the exam, Boston has a similar um, process, but I think it's a little bit more diverse. I mean, you know, it's kind of a paradox. Why New York doesn't have a commitment to desegregation programs? Because de facto, they're having taught math and social justice together, we, we have to look at that context, how, I mean, we're probably just as segregated as we were two decades ago. It's, in, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Although it's, we don't have to do that. But. Right. And what are the policies that encourage that? I mean, in New York and in Boston, there's exam schools, right? So there's, you know, there's a way to weed out certain people that haven't had access to the test taking skills that <laughs> were required to do well on those tests. Um, in Albuquerque, it's, it's quite different. I mean, there's definitely, it's socioeconomic and race together. Um, <clears throat> but even within that, you still see differences in the, the lived experiences of even middle class um, kids of color. You know, I, I can't tell you how many administrators I know who t tell me, you know, my Latino boy who goes to the predominantly white school is always singled out for things that his colleagues are, or his peers are not, and particularly if you're a black male. <laughs> in fact, the biggest scandal was in Albuquerque about a year ago, two African-American young men who were attending a graduation ceremony were suspended for using a gang sign. And they turned around and said, um, everyone else was using a gang sign. Why are, why are we getting a, a so-called gang sign? Obviously, it wasn't. It was, they did some, something. But why were they singled out when everyone else was engaged in the same behavior? And there's a lawsuit related to that. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.